And we're just about ready to get started here with our first speaker, who is the Orange County Zeitgeist Coordinator. His name is Ryan Johnson, and he's going to do a presentation entitled Science for Social Rules. Let's give him a warm welcome. All right, hello everyone. Um, so we have a plan for today. We're going to start with science and then each speaker after me will elaborate on that process and how we arrive at what's called a natural law resource-based economy. So first I would just want to make the case for why do we use science? Why, why science is the backbone of this movement? So I really like this quote here. It says, the real purpose of the scientific method is to make sure nature hasn't misled you into thinking you know something you actually don't. So when we have misunderstandings, whether it's in relationships or in our way of approaching reality, when we don't understand something, that leads to problems. And sci the scientific method is our process of resolving problems because we have challenges to survive, right? And if we can be better problem solvers, then we can survive and live well. I do tabling activism a lot, and um, I often meet people that will say, oh, you know, whatever you think and you put out there, that's what you get back. That's one way of thinking about reality, but um, then you would have to explain a lot of negative uh, circumstances that people go through. So maybe a child that gets leukemia, did they want to have that happen to them? Someone who is raped, did they ask for that to be hap happen to them? I mean, you have to explain all those things by this person has put it out there and they just want that reality to come to them. and it's. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's uh, somewhat popular in new agey circles, but um, we, we really need to move beyond that and look at it as, okay, we have a reality and how do we, how do we best understand that process? So when we have some misunderstandings, here are a couple examples. Uh, the first one is the uh, article, America's Most Wealthy Believe the Poors Have It Easy. So when, when you have um, a group of people that own most of the wealth and they think that the poor are living it up, it's, it's great for them. So why, why should we care about them? Why should we do anything to resolve their problem? We don't need to because they're fine. They're, they're, they're living a great life. So again, we have, a, we have a misunderstanding about what their situation is like, and then there's nothing done to resolve that. Another example was striving for the perfect diet is making us sick. So there's a lot that you can read about um, this is the healthiest thing to eat or you should take vitamins or you don't need to take vitamins and you know whether or not you should have um, a lot of vegetables or less fiber. I mean, you can read about anything. And it's very confusing to us because how do we know? How do we know what that what is really true? Can we just intuit it? No. So we need the scientific process to detail, okay, these are the things that actually promote health. But I'll get to a slide later, but we have some things that uh, kind of corrupt the process of science. So the next one. Um, humans are fragile beings, right? We, you know, if we get too cold, we're dead. If we don't eat frequently enough, we're dead. We can't just hibernate. So we, we can get one virus and we can die from that. So we're very fragile, but our strength is our ability to problem solve and to adapt. Sometimes that adaptation can be negative because you can, um, you can adapt to very poor circumstances or learned helplessness, things like that. And so you can get entrenched in behaviors that aren't healthy for you. And so that, that's kind of the bad side. But the good side is that we can meet so many challenges in our natural environment and overcome them by having a better understanding. Uh, how do we, so how do we come to know reality? What's the process that we learn about it? So the first is uh, superstitions. We're superstitious creatures. We think things that happen together, oh, it must be luck, and they must be tied together. It's not necessarily the case. Intuitions, we think evolution was a progressive process, but it's not really progressive. It's just about adaptation to a sp particular environment. Um, superstitions, people do maybe rain dances for crops, or they do an animal sacrifice, something like that, because they think that's going to bring them prosperity. Um, opinions. So maybe you really like the idea of a soul and that you live on forever and ever. Um, so it feels good, but is that what reality is? Religions, we have, uh, it's very sh shameful of sex, even though sex is a natural part of human life. Um, might, so might makes right. If you're the strongest one and you kill your opponent, it's your way. But those, those ways aren't really, um, uh, accurate ways of understanding reality. And so the alternative to that is science. And that's why 
that's again why we need to problem solve using this method because it helps us break down the break down our false intuitions and like that first slide said break down the misunderstandings that we have about reality so here's what the process looks like in a little diagram we observe observation is the backbone um, so when you observe something you by really paying attention to it you learn about what what is that phenomena and you can start documenting all the um, you know the minutia of how that how that process or event unfolds in reality and then you come up with a theory then you can predict what's going to happen next based on those that certain set of evidence and then the process repeats so observation and analysis is the beginning and then the questions lead to more questions so we never have a final answer if someone thinks that they know the end truth of something they've already been misled because the process is evolving and our understanding can never be complete because it's not infinite but our goal with the resource-based economy isn't to get to perfection it's just to get to better and so if we can be better problem solvers then we can have better lives and um, so I want to try a little experiment here. I tutored once this kid that was about five years, no, fifth grade. And um, I, I said, you know, science and statistics are really cool because they're like having a crystal ball. You can tell about the future. So I made a prediction. And I'm going to ask you guys, just by a raise of hands, um, how many of you have used GPS? OK, can I have someone guess how many that is percent wise? 99? Okay. I guessed about 90% of the people would have used a GPS. Okay, now how many people that have used it have had some kind of error? You've been led astray. Okay, so what's that percent? You think it's the same? I thought it was a little bit less. So I, I guessed about 60%, so I was wrong. I, I estimated too low. Now, now you'd think, okay, here's a great technology, but Actually, it's leading people on the wrong path. So how many of you still use GPS? It's reliable more than the past, so. Works most of the time. Yeah, exactly. So I, I guess 90% still use it. And that's about accurate, right? So look at me. I'm, I'm like, I, I, I'm omniscient. I could tell what you guys were going to say before I got here. How did I know that? Because I observed. I observed my own behavior. I knew that I've been led astray. But I also know that, it, like, like she said, it's more reliable than it isn't. So I'm going to use that tool repeatedly. It, it, it advantages me. One of the problems is I think people think that science is some foreign process. Like, oh, you have to go to years of study, and then that's how you become scientific. It's this esoteric field, and it's really hard to break into. But we really need to understand that science, the process of science, the process of observation is innate to us. So are superstitions and intuitions and opinions. But science is also an innate process. And when we can kind of claim ownership of that, it doesn't make it so scary. Like, that scientist told me to do this thing. So they're imposing it on me. It's more like, oh, if, if, I, if I went into the same field of study and I wanted to know about reality in this specific way, like I wanted to know about how neurons operate, I would find the same thing that this person would because they're following the scientific process. I just wrote this out. The scientific process attempts to harness the power of observation and whittle away bias to produce accurate understanding and predictions, making us better problem solvers. Now the bad side. I put a little cloud there so you can see that I'm sad about that. Um, so the scientific process is corrupted by business. So when I talked earlier about uh, food, there's so many people that have interests in you taking a supplement or you eating a certain, like, I'm a, a acai berry crop owner, so I want you guys all to believe that that's a superfood and it's the only way to reverse aging, right? So you have all of these things that make you feel like, is that, is that trustworthy? Because I can't have a PhD in every field, right? That's impossible. So business can erode our sense of trust in science, and that's a big problem that we have, which is why in the movement, we want to move beyond, we want to move beyond business as usual and that incentive to take advantage of my ignorance because I'm always going to be ignorant about something. And if someone can know that I'm ignorant about that thing and take advantage of me for that, then you know it's their reward. So they get rewarded for that behavior. And that's why it's so detrimental because as, it, as knowledge increases more and more, it's harder for one little person to keep up with all that information. So we have to be able to um, 
We, we need to have trust in our scientific process and in the people that are engaged in scientific discovery. Uh, ego. Ego is another problem. Um, sometimes people get very attached to their theory, their idea. This is very common among all of us. Um, and so that's something that I'll talk about uh, in part two. And bias, whose assumptions are unquestioned. So we have a lot of default assumptions about how reality works. And this is where diversity re is really helpful to us because if I come from a different place, a different language, you know, a different ethnic group, whatever it is, then they can serve as a check on my, on my assumptions. They will bring up those assumptions. Like, we, you think it's this way, but that's because that's how you've been raised. So that's why diversity in the process of discovery is so important. So I wanted to point out that nature, people will say, hey, you know, we're all ruthless human beings. Like, that's kill or be killed, and that's how the process is. And that's true. We can be that way but we can also be very cooperative. I just think we forget how cooperative we can be and how, how being cooperative really helps all of us together. So we have, we have certain rules in society that we've accepted, right? Like if people go, oh, I don't want anybody restricting my freedoms. But we say you can't own other humans anymore. We used to say that was okay. And we say you can't force them with threat of injury or death unless we have a war, then it's totally okay. And, and so why do we accept those rules? I mean, what if I say, no, I want to own 10 human beings, or I want to be able to take my gun and boss them around? You would say, well, Ryan, you're a psychopath, and we're not going to allow you to have that kind of freedom. But so, so we understand that these rules, even though they limit us in some ways, they actually advantage us in more ways than they limit us. Now I have a little video. Again and again in nature, from the very most ancient bacteria to more recent species, they go through a juvenile phase of hostile competition to establish themselves. And then they discover the economics of cooperation. And when they find that it is cheaper and more efficient and more beneficial for everyone, to feed your enemy rather than fighting them, then we are on the way to the new civilization we're all looking for. She was a biologist, and she was just talking about organisms go through a process where at first they're kind of competitive, but once they become cooperative, they, they actually become more efficient, and that was the gist of that slide. Um, so I wanted to talk about socioeconomic rules because in, in economic circles, it's often talked about in terms of an individual transaction, like I have two apples, you have two oranges, we share, hey, hey, everyone's happy, right? But sometimes, like, what, what if I have a gallon of milk and you have a gallon of juice? And we say, oh, well, you could give me half a gallon of milk and I could give you half a gallon of juice. But what if I change the dynamic just slightly, and this is true for me, I can't, I can't digest dairy. So I have a gallon of milk, and you know that now. So then you can go, shoot, I could trade two drops of juice for his gallon of milk because he can't have that. He can't consume that, right? So in that individual transaction, just by changing one small thing, I've changed the dynamic and that outcome, right? So now I'm forced, like, this milk's no good for me. So I need to have, I mean, whatever you want to give me, I'll do because my, my physiological condition limits me. Um, so... The point is that when we look at these rules that guide our economic behavior, we have to pay attention to what kinds of outcomes they're producing. In a society that where we're trading things and everything seems voluntary, right? We should have a society in which everybody loves their job. Why would you ever do anything that you didn't love to do? Well, because you're coerced to do so or you're forced to do so to earn your living, right? So we have to, that's why we have to look at the outcomes, not just the individual transaction. And uh, I just wanted to point out that we already expect science to inform many of the decisions we make. So if you have a cell phone or you go to the dentist or um, you, know, you, you, you drive on the bridge, you expect that someone has figured out how to, how to design those things so that they're not dangerous to you. We, we just have that expectation. And we're just trying to take that process and apply it to our economic situation. And so, again, the goal isn't that we're going to reach perfection. We just want it to have better outcomes than we see today. Um, okay, so moving on to part two. 
I can't verify if Albert Einstein really said it, but I like the quote, so here it is. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And I, I really like this quote because it, it recognizes the fact that each person has some kind of talent, and those talents we should appreciate even if they're not marketable. So someone may be very caring for another person, and um, that is often undervalued. Okay, so teaching scientific literacy. One of the things that we have to understand too is that sometimes we'll come to incorrect understandings, but that's not a reflection of me. So earlier I'm, I said that, um, what was it, that 60% had errors but in their GPS, but it was actually 90%. Now I could walk out of here pounding and saying, oh, I'm such a bad person, I'm a dumbass, and just leave. But really, I just go, oh, OK, I just misunderstood something. I misunderstood something about reality. Now you've corrected me. I'm better off for that. And that, even though it seems like, oh, that's so basic, that's not a big deal, but actually, if people could really understand that process, and if we had practice with learning how to approach knowledge and our understanding in a way that it's kind of like you're observing yourself and having that uh, misperception, then you can be thankful, like, wow, you corrected my misunderstanding, so now I'll be better off too, and you'll be better off. And that's something that we have to teach. We have to teach kids. And we don't, we don't do that now because we tell them, you know, get into your position and defend it with all your might, and then it's just like this big battle, and there's no reconciliation of the two. And that, that's not conducive to bringing out co social cohesion and, um, you know, better results for all of us. So the idea is that we are not what our idea is. Our worth isn't based on that idea itself. Okay, some closing notes. I just wanted to talk about life. Life is an experiment. We all think that, wow, what if we, what if we uh, implement this um, thing that the Zeitgeist Movement is talking about? Well, maybe it'll just drive us off a cliff. But we're already in an experiment. We live in an experiment. This right now is a social experiment in socioeconomic design. And we, so it's not like we're going to go to an experimental design. We're already in one. We're just saying, we think this one's not working. So we need to change the way it functions. And our, because of the amount of evidence that we have around it, we expect it to produce better outcomes. So I just want you to kind of get out of that idea that, you know, like this, this is our default. This is, this is reality. And if we do something different, that then we're going to be in this crazy experiment and who knows where it's going to lead. Instead, we're just saying we're already in one and we're just going to change it because this isn't working. And again, suffering is a sign that things are broken, that things are not working. So when someone's suffering, we have to pay attention to that, figure out why that's happening. And that's why, as the Zeitgeist Movement, we advocate for a redesign to correct these flaws. That's it.